Hi everybody, this is Katya Eckhart. Welcome to my YouTube video channel. This evening I'm wearing this uh, kind of midnight blue floral dress uh, that I wanted to model for you briefly. Uh, I also have a pair of spiked uh, black heels, stiletto heels to go with it, and uh, pantyhose. So I wanted to model that out for you. And this evening I'm going to continue with the material that I was discussing last time. And this has to do with how certain uh, philosophical ideas that we can find in Fred Friedrich Nietzsche's thought might be used to criticize not faith per se, but certain theological misinterpretations of it. So let's get right down to business and talk about that a little bit. Now, what I want to do this evening is um, I want to describe the second theological option um, another theological option that I want to subject to a Nietzschean critique in my next video. But this time, all I'm going to do is describe this theological option. And like the first one, the Galassenheit theology, this, this other theology comes out of, I have extracted it from uh, the later philosophy of Martin Heidegger and some of the work that I've done on that. Now, remember that last time we discussed Galassenheit theology, and the main idea of that is that our fundamental experience of the holy of, or of divinity is a kind of Gelassenheit, which in German is letting be, it's a kind of energized tranquility. Now, I discussed that last time, I'm not going to say anything more about it now. This evening, the theological option that I would like to discuss is Streit theology, where Streit is the German word for struggle. And this theological option identifies our fundamental experience of divinity, not with Galassenheit, but with a kind of struggle. That is, our confrontation with an enigmatic and an obscure and mysterious, even paradoxical divinity from which we try to wrest some kind of clarity. So that's our fundamental experience of divinity according to Streit theology. Now, what I'm going to do tonight is simply describe this option, in, uh, give you an overview of it, and the next time I will subject it to the Nietzschean critique. So there are four main parts of this that I want to describe briefly. One is how it involves anxiety. Uh, the second part is how the anxiety leads to a predicament. The third part is how the predicament can initially be overcome with a notion that Heidegger calls the splendor of the simple. And then finally, uh, the fourth part is how the dilemma can, or the predicament can be finally overcome through the notion of conversity in divinity, what Heidegger calls conversity. So let's get right down to business and talk about those four things. Now the anxiety comes out when Heidegger is talking in his later philosophy about this experience of anxiety that we feel sometimes, this kind of a deep unsettledness that we feel when we're confronted with something. What's interesting about it is that for Heidegger, depending on what text you're looking at in his later writings, the, the sort of intentional correlate or the object, if you will, of desire, what it's directed at, is something different. So sometimes it's human existence, or in German, Dasein. Uh, sometimes it might be a particular uncanny individual being that's not human, uh, an uncanny non-human being. Sometimes it might be the totality of beings taken as a whole. Sometimes it might be the idea of there being absolutely nothing at all, a kind of das nicht in German. Um, and then uh, so, so those are the first. And then finally, it could also be anxiety about this event of non-metaphysical being, this sort of radically new, non-metaphysical way the world might present itself to us. Those five different ontological conditions are at different times in Heidegger's later writings uh, things that we have anxiety about. Now what's interesting about that is that if anxiety is about something in particular, then it kind of follows from that that it's not really about any one of those things. Because if anxiety, let's say when we have anxiety about our own existence or that side, um, if, if, if anxiety is about something in particular, then the only way it could be about, let's say, the non-metaphysical event of being or any of the other 
ontological conditions besides human existence that I mentioned, is it would have those things would have to be identical with our existence, with my existence or our existence, and it's not. So the anxiety ultimately, because Heidegger directs it at different things in his different in his later philosophy, it follows that it really isn't about any of those things, or at least that's the way the strike theologian construes it. So anxiety is about something that transcends all of those things. And according to the strike theologian, what anxiety is ultimately about is God, or the holy, or this notion of divinity that's not identical with any of those previous things that I just mentioned. Now, why do we have anxiety about it? Well, that leads to the second part of the, of the strike the, uh, theological position, and that is that we, we are somehow responsible, as Heidegger says in the Beiträge zur Philosophy, the contributions to philosophy, which I've discussed before, we are responsible for making a faithful decision about divinity, uh, that, that that somehow is what enables us to emerge or to enter into complete, genuine selfhood. The problem is that uh, God is not any one of those five ontological conditions that I mentioned, and furthermore, that's all we have to go on. So the predicament is that we have to make a decision, but the only means that we have to make it are things that are completely different from divinity, and, and indeed, something that this mysterious notion of the holy, or God, transcends. So the question is, well, how can we make the decision? The only things that we have to go on None of those things, by the previous argument, can be the same as God, according to strike theology, and yet we still have to make some kind of a decision that, that will determine whether we become genuine selves. It's a fateful decision. So that's a predicament. And that's the, third, that's the second part. Well, what's the third part? Well, how does the splendor of the simple come in? Well, Heidegger says something very interesting in one of his later, more poetic works, and that is that somehow divinity is fully present in each one of those five ontological conditions. It's completely simple. And so it's fully implemented or fully embodied uh, or, or fully manifested whether I'm somehow reflecting on my own existence, my Dasein, or you're reflecting on your Dasein, or whether I'm thinking about a particular being that's not human, or I'm thinking about the totality of beings that, that we can all the things that we that we confront around us in their totality, or if I'm thinking about the possibility that there might be absolutely nothing at all, and at some point there wasn't anything at all, or finally this idea of this radically non-metaphysical event or understanding of being that might happen. Um, somehow, when we encounter any one of those things, because divinity is fully manifested or uh, fully involved in each one of those conditions without being identical to it, we are already encountering divinity. Now that helps to begin to move us beyond the predicament because what it suggests is that whenever we encounter any one of those ontological conditions, we are already encountering divinity because divinity is fully present or fully uh, working or manifest in that. Now, then the final part is conversity. And what is conversity? Why does that come into the strike theology at all? Well, the danger is that if divinity is present in each one of those five ontological conditions, and divinity is absolutely simple, Heidegger calls it the splendor of the simple, well, that means that divinity doesn't have any division within it. That means that the divinity doesn't have any plurality in it, and so if divinity is identical with all of those things, then they're not really separate things, or so the worry goes. They all kind of coalesce into this one big blob that's the same thing as divinity. It's a kind of monism, as the philosophers would say, and that's not true to our experience of the world, because certainly my Dasein is different from yours, it's different from the being of a bird, or this non-human being that I see over here, it's different from the totality of beings, from nothingness, and from the non-metaphysical event of being. So 
The splendor of the simple, when we apply it to divinity, that's present or fully manifested in each one of those conditions, the danger is that that will cause everything to collapse into just one big blob, one big thing, and that's really not the way the world is or the way things are. Now, how does conversity help with that? And here's the last thing I want to say this evening. Diversity, or I'm sorry, conver conversity, the converse, which is a notion that Heidegger takes from the poetry of Georg Trakl, the, the notion of converse is that even though divinity is present in each one of those things that I mentioned, those conditions, it's not the same as any one of them. It outstrips it, we might say. Why is that? Well, that's because those conditions can obtain independently of each other. For example, at some point, in, in, you know, at some point there wasn't anything at all. There was no universe, there, there was no time, there was no space, there was nothingness. And yet somehow divinity, according to the splendor of the simple, was fully manifested in this condition of absolute nothingness which obtained, even though none of the other four ontological conditions obtained, so that means divinity is not the same as any one of those. Similarly now, when we have the totality of things around us in the world, absolute nothingness does not obtain, and yet this totality of beings does, that we uh, find in the universe as it actually is. And so, since divinity is fully manifested in that, in the totality of beings, even though absolute nothingness no longer obtains, then that shows that divinity is also not the same as absolute nothingness. And I could go through each one of the ontological conditions and show that they could obtain independently of any, of any one of the others, so that um, divinity is going to be present in any one of the other ontological conditions, even when the, the other ones are not there. So the idea, very, very basically, very, very roughly, the idea is that when we take the splendor of the simple and apply it to divinity, and then we bring in this notion of conversity in divinity, that it's not identical with any one of the ontological conditions that it is nevertheless fully manifested in, each one of them, then it looks like we are on the brink of making the decision to, to come face to face with this paradoxical divinity. And whatever we come face to face with, it will always outstrip itself, there will always be more to it. That also falls out, I think, of this notion of conversity. So that's the theological position that I wanted to describe very roughly and very generally this evening to give you an idea of what it is. So that next time, when we turn our attention to the Nietzschean critique of it, we will be very prepared to understand the position against which the critique is directed and how the critique is supposed to work. So I'm going to stop there. And I know that this is complicated and there's a lot of material, but I also think it's very interesting, it's very exciting, and it really can draw you in uh, when you begin to think about it. I know that it has drawn me in, and it's helped me, I believe, to make progress in my own thinking about these issues. So this is Katya Eckhart, and again, thank you for joining me. Thank you for being patient with, with me. Um, and I hope that you enjoyed this material, and I hope that you will join me again for my next video. Until that time, I wish everybody safe and a restful and a blessed evening. Thank you so much for joining me. Bye-bye.